Wonderful weekend, uh, a lot of uh, people gone away, a lot of people visiting today. Labor Day weekend. You know, despite the downturn in our economy in the last couple of years, uh, there's still a lot to be thankful for as we consider the idea of work this Labor Day weekend. Even though unemployment uh, nationally is about you know, 7% or so, some people say as high as 10%, depends where you're at. You know, I kind of think of it this way, well if, if, if our unemployment is 10%, that means 90% of the people are employed. I mean that may not be a comfort to those who are looking for a job, but still 90%, it's not bad, 90% of the people are earning a living, paying taxes, paying off their houses, buying stuff, selling stuff. Now there's a relative labor peace in our country, and of course there's still a lot of career opportunities here not available in other countries. Last I heard, it's still very difficult to get into the United, to the United States because there's lots of opportunity here and a lot of people want that opportunity that exists. Now, the system that we have here in the U.S. is very different, however, than the system that God has to reward His workers in the kingdom. And there's the segue from Labor Day to my, to my lesson today. So on this Labor Day holiday, I'd like for us to look at a parable that describes how God pays His workers, those who are employed in the kingdom. And so therefore that's why we want to go to Matthew chapter 20, look at a parable, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. So read with me please, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Jesus begins this story by declaring that the following parable about a landowner and his laborers is really an explanation of how the kingdom of God works. So those of you who are hearing this lesson, you, keep, you have to keep an eye on that idea as we read through. Jesus is explaining how things work in the kingdom of heaven. You know, parables are stories that explain what is unseen with descriptions of what can be seen and can be touched. They're a glimpse into the spiritual world and its principles through the lens of physical relationships and principles at work here in the material world. You know, the word parable means to lay alongside and so what Jesus is doing is he's laying down this story about a landowner and how this landowner dealt with his hired hands in order to reveal the matching principle of how God deals with his servants in the spiritual kingdom. So we have a story about what's taking place in the material world to explain what's taking place in the spiritual world. A story that explains things we can see in order to uh, help us to understand things that we cannot see, all right? And so in verse two, keeping all those things in mind, we continue with the parable that Jesus is saying. He says, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And so they agree, the, the, the landowner and the workers, they agree for the normal wage at that time, which was one denarius. One denarius has been translated into today's money worth about 17 cents. Now this was equivalent to a Roman soldier's daily wage at the time. And so it was a fair wage. It was enough to provide and support one's needs at the time. So we keep reading and it says in verse three, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and to those he said, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And at about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing uh, idle here all day long? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. 
Now in those days, the work day, and for many of you it's the same today, but in those days the work day was 12 hours, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., you know, sun up to sun down. And so we see the master hire laborers every three hours or so, right until the final hour before quitting time. Now there's no mention of wages here because this group is working only part of the day and they expect to be paid at the discretion of the landowner. So let's keep reading, this time in verse eight. It says, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his, um, to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the, uh, to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And so once the day is over, everybody is paid, and the surprising thing is that each worker received a full day's salary. The ones who worked an entire day, along with the ones who only worked one hour. So let's see what the follow-up is to the payday. Verse 11, when they received it, meaning the ones who had worked the entire day, when they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. So here we see the ones who worked all day long becoming angry and dissatisfied because the landowner paid the ones who worked one hour the same as the ones who worked hard for 12 hours. And you know what? I can identify with those people. I get it, I, I feel for them because from our perspective it might seem unfair for the ones who work 12 hours not to make any more money than the ones who only work one hour. I mean, Right off the bat, I, I'm voting with these guys. I'm saying, yeah, they should have more money. But you need to remember that this parable is not designed to show how things work in our society, but rather how things work in the spiritual kingdom of God. Remember I told you at the beginning, keep your eye on that idea. So let's read verse 13 now. It says, but he, meaning the landowner, but he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go, but I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So in the parable, we see the master answer to all the day workers by telling them several important things. First of all, he says, well, I haven't cheated anyone because you know, he's, he's paid the agreed amount. He said, I was going to pay a denarius to these people, and I did, and then the others, I told them I'd give them what I thought was fair. Secondly, he says, as the landowner, has he not the right to pay his men whatever he wants? After all, it's his money. And then thirdly, if they feel badly, it's because they're envious of his generosity. In other words, they're just jealous because they wouldn't do this if they were the landowner. And I have to tell you, you know, if I was the landowner, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have done that. It'd be an opportunity to just pay everybody you know, their quote, just wage. Then in verse 16, Jesus here makes a comment about the parable to those who are hearing it. And I'll comment on this particular verse once we go back through the parable to see what the Lord is teaching about the kingdom uh, and what happens in it. You know, in order to make an application of this or any parable, it's helpful if you kind of break it down to its basic elements so you see what each element represents. For example, the vineyard in the parable. The vineyard is God's service in this world. You know, it's taken many forms throughout history, but basically it boils down to doing the Lord's work. The landowner, well the landowner is God Himself. He is the one who calls us into His service, whether it is by direct calling, as He did to many in the Old Testament, or through the call of Christ while Christ was here on earth, or through the gospel message given by the apostles. God is the one who calls. God is the one who sends out to work and who rewards in the end. And of course, He also punishes 
But this parable is not addressing the aspect of punishment, only the aspect of reward. And then the laborers are those who God calls. In a very general sense, the laborers represent all those who have been called by God to be saved and then put to work in the kingdom of God in one way or in others. Now, the early and late laborers can therefore represent a, you know, a difference in service before, between several historic groups. You know, the, the laborers, they can be a variety of people. For example, they can be the Jews and the Gentiles. You know, the Jews, they were the early workers who were called to serve God's purpose long ago with Abraham, and for several millennia they were special servants in bringing Christ to the world. And then the Gentiles, well, they could be the late workers, non-Jews, they benefited from the gospel long after many generations of Jews had died, never ever seeing the promise that was made. So the Gentiles could be the, the late workers. Another way you could look at this is uh, the apostles and their followers. The apostles were the first to preach and suffered most of them uh, martyrdom. And they left everything to preach and establish the church and they made great sacrifices. You know, that's what Jesus was saying to Peter in the verse that was read before the lesson. And then all the Christians that came after them and have built on their work, they're the ones that have benefited from their original sacrifice and their original service. So you know, the early apostles and and Christians. Or they could represent old and young Christians. Some have served the Lord a lifetime, struggling with sin and the world and adversity in order to finish a long and faithful life. And others come to Christ late in life. Think of the thief on the cross. They go to directly to paradise without much service or suffering. How many times have you heard someone who you know, became a Christian when they were 96 years old and hallelujah, you know, a month later passed away and everybody, everybody goes hallelujah. You know, well, he's a kind of a late worker there. So this parable can equally apply to any of these different groups without affecting the core meaning of it, as you will see. And then there's the payment aspect of this parable and the attitude and the response. The key feature of this parable and the one upon which the lessons from it rest is the wage that the landowner pays each worker. The attitude of the first group and the response from the master. So the wage represents grace. God rewards each person who comes to Him and serves Him with His grace. Each person receives the same grace regardless of their service. And the attitude of the first group represents some people's attitude towards God and towards His grace in every age. You know, there have always been those people who had trouble understanding and accepting or extending God's grace. It just bugs them that some people who seem unworthy receive God's grace anyways and it gets on their nerves, they don't like that idea. And then of course the master's response is the Lord's response to those who question His grace. These are the remaining parallels for various elements in the parable. Now of course parables teach lessons. So now that we've tried to line up the parable and the spiritual counterparts, what lesson or lessons was Jesus trying to teach us with this parable? Well, there could be several. For example, God calls us at different times. There's, there's a lesson that'll preach. Or maybe God is fair, God is just. That is also a lesson here. Or there's work for everyone. That's another lesson you could draw. But the one that I think is the central lesson in this parable is this. All who respond to God's call receive the same reward, grace. And I also believe that uh, these, uh, there were several important reasons why this particular lesson needed to be taught, that God rewards all those He calls with the same gift, which is grace. A couple of reasons He taught that. First of all, first of all He taught it for the Jews. Jesus knew that the Jews, thinking that they had exclusive rights to God's reward, would reject any attempt to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, and of course they did. 
We read in the book of Acts and many of his epistles how Paul struggled with his fellow Jews, you know, Christians and, and non-Christians, on how God's intention was to bring the Gentiles into fellowship with the Jews in Christ Jesus. He talks about it in Ephesians chapter two. We see how he was nearly killed for even suggesting such a thing. The Jews were the all day laborers and they resisted and resented the idea that the Gentiles, these last minute guys, would have the same reward as they. Even Jewish Christians felt superior than their Gentile brothers and tried to relegate them to second class positions in the early church and the apostles fought that battle all the time. Another reason to teach this idea through this parable was that Jesus taught it for all those who would become legalists. You know, the Jews felt they were owed more because of their ancient culture. However, in every age, there are those who feel they deserve a reward or a better reward because of their pride. This spiritual pride usually takes the form of legalism. The legalist feels he has a right to be in the kingdom and receive his reward because he has in some way earned it. The legalist does the work in order to purchase the right and purchasing the right uh, feeds pride. It's a vicious circle. More work, more righteousness. More effort, I feel better. More, more works and I feel even better still. And eventually they feel that they have more right to be in the kingdom than those who have done less work. They also believe that they deserve a better reward because of their larger quantity of work. And with this parable, Jesus teaches the legalist that the payment or the reward does not depend on the amount of work or who does the work. You know, here the harder you work, the more you make. In the kingdom, the payment is based on the generosity of the master, not the work of the servant. In the parable, as in the kingdom, the laborers are rewarded for answering the call, not the number of hours that they worked. You know, in our society, it's true. We are paid based on what we do, how hard we work, the effort we make, the results we get, that's you know, the democratic system, that's how it works. But that's not how it works in the kingdom. Jesus taught this because in every age, legalists need to understand that the salary, the reward, the salvation has been earned by Christ, not his followers. Nobody here, including myself, of course, could ever earn salvation for themselves or someone else. The salary, the reward, the salvation has been earned by Jesus the Master on the cross, not by anything we do. He earns the grace that He gives to every person who answers His call to come into the kingdom, which is the church, and labor for Him, no matter how long you have to labor. This then answers the question, why does everyone receive the same wage for different levels of work? Remember now, this doesn't make sense from a worldly perspective, but from a spiritual one it does. Why do we all receive the same reward? And yet, it's obvious not everybody does the same work. Well, we all receive the same regardless of work because as I've already said, Jesus is the one who has earned our salary for us and so our reward is based on our responding to His call, not our work. I mean, listen, that's why it's called the good news. <laughs> if we had to earn it, it wouldn't be good news. You know, here's the good news. You know, the good news is uh, Marty, our office manager, says, uh, um, this is the Labor Day weekend, and uh, as the office manager, um, uh, the office will be closed on Monday. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah, why? Because the employees get the day off, but they get paid. That's good news. Now, what if he said, all right, now, you know, we have Monday off, you know, uh, but you'll all have to come in on next Saturday to make up for Monday. Is that good news? No, that, that's not good news. 
It'll get the work done, but it's not good news for the employees. Another reason why he makes this parable or this point. We all receive the same because we all need exactly the same thing. We all need grace, no more, no less, because it is by grace that we acquire all of the heavenly blessings reserved in heaven for us. Tell me, what is it that you have done specifically to earn forgiveness? Tell me, what have you done specifically to earn sonship? What have you done specifically to earn righteousness? What have you done specifically to earn resurrection, to earn eternal life, to earn freedom from sin forever? What, what, what have we done to earn those things? Well, nothing. If we have grace, the Bible tells us, we have all of these things and we have them forever. Paul tells us this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. This is why everyone gets the same thing because it's the thing that everybody needs. And then finally, we all receive the same because it is the right and perfect payment. Any different payment would be less than perfect, less than divine, and God's, perf uh, God's payment is perfectly suited to us. If we question the payment that someone else receives, we are questioning God. We're saying, you know what, God, I think you made a mistake here. I think you're giving too much to this person and not enough to me. That's what I think, really. I don't know, do you really want to be that person? Do you want to be that guy on judgment day? Do you want to be the person that God says, okay, all those who thought I made some sort of mistake, would you uh, step up here, please? <laughs> all those who questioned the gifts that I gave, you know, come on forward, you know, let, let's reason together. You know, in every generation there are those who mistakenly try to earn what God has given freely through Jesus Christ. The parable continually sets before them the principles upon which our salvation is based the free offer of grace to all those who will answer the call of the gospel in faithful obedience. And so, seen in this light, Jesus' rather enigmatic statement in verse 16, you know, where He says, thus the last shall be first and the first shall be last, simply repeats the main thrust of the lesson which has already been given in the parable. In other words, He's saying, in this way, the last are first and the first are last, that they all receive the same reward. That's how the last are first and the first are last. They all get in the same thing. In the world, your reward is based on merit and work and time and effort and talent. But in the kingdom, everyone receives the same reward. Those who are called first, those who come in the middle, and those who arrive at the very last moment. The first and the last are the same because they answered the same call with the same response, and that was faithful obedience. Thus, Abraham, the father of the Jews, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the newest Christian baptized this morning will each receive the same reward if Jesus were to appear tomorrow morning. The first and the very last get exactly the same thing. And so whatever labor I do, for as long as I do it, is simply a way to continue saying, I believe, I love, I hope. No matter what you do or what I do, all of what we do is simply saying day after day after day, I continue to believe, I continue to love, and I continue to hope. Whether a person works for one hour or one century in the name of the Lord, I am happy for them because like myself, they have known the Lord, they have loved Him as I do, and they will share the same gracious reward. As I close out, I ask you a question. When your labor on this earth is done, what will you have to show for it? An inheritance for your children and your children's children? Will you have much property? Will you leave a good name? 
perhaps great accomplishments? Will you have these things or will your labor be a lifetime of loving service to the God who calls you into His kingdom? If you respond to His call in faithful obedience, and when I talk about faithful obedience, the Bible tells us that faith in the response to the gospel is expressed in repentance and in baptism. If you respond to His call, He will reward you with the blessings of grace in this life and the life to come. And so whether it's early or whether it's late in your life, remember His grace is available even at the 11th hour. The Lord calls you to Him today. Won't you respond to Him according to your need?